Hey everyone, this is your soul, and I'm going to cover a topic here which is obviously very controversial, and I fully expect many people to be upset about what I'm going to say here, and I also expect many people to agree with me and to understand already really what I'm talking about. But I just want, before I start on this rabbit hole, to explain that my understanding of the psychology involved in Donald Trump and other leaders of various governments, including George W. Bush Jr. and others, ultimately stems from my own exploration of psychology in healing myself and of studying many, many different topics connected to human spirit, soul, mind, emotions, body, all the different aspects of self. I don't have a qualification from a university. I'm not a licensed practitioner of any form of therapy. I am somebody who's sought to heal themselves and realized long ago that my own state of being, my own thought processes, my own beliefs and so on can often be found reflected in other people in very different ways. And sometimes I pick them up from other people and sometimes they pick them up from me and sometimes we both pick them up from somewhere else. But often it can be helpful to look at other people to understand myself because I have, as most people do, black spots or denial areas, let's say, where there's a process involved in my psychology which I don't fully understand or recognise. and that's ultimately why we have a lot of counsellors and therapists and uh, specialists in mental health because the person who's going to see them often can't identify the things that these specialists can see. So if you're looking to solve your own problems, whatever they may be, find greater balance, well-being and happiness and so on, it often can be helpful to look at other people first and, or well, not necessarily first, but at least to look at other people and look for the tips and signs that you can identify in them that you can say, oh, well, that what that person's doing is obviously unbalanced. And then you can look to see whether you're doing it or maybe you're doing some other form of it that's similar but not exactly the same thing. That's how I got started. And I've listened to many, many, many different voices on these subjects. And basically it comes down to the kinds of things that I've talked about before regarding emotional health and well-being. And I'll continue to talk about, namely, primarily denial. And that means the key root problem that I, as I understand it, that causes most of our problems in society is our own denial. Denial of reality, denial of our own emotions, self-denial, lack of self-acceptance, and all of the various different diagnoses that can spiral out of that and all of the different dysfunctions, but they tend to all have this at their root. And this generally hasn't really been fully recognised by most specialists either, which is another reason why I'm talking about this. The reason why I'm bringing this up in regards to Donald Trump is that there's quite a lot of stories in the news recently about his mental health bearing in mind some of the things he's publicly said and agreed to on twitter uh, a lot of the stories are kind of spinning and warping his words a little bit but they're not exactly wrong um he did say while looking up to the sky i'm the chosen one he could have just said that as if it was a neutral statement of fact which is that his government people of his country through election had chosen him to make the decisions he was making with regards to America's relationship to China, as most politicians would generally do. It's just a business issue. But he, he says it in a kind of stage-managed theatrical way and literally looks up to the sky as if he's talking to God and God literally put him there to do this. Now, obviously, we have, generally speaking, the separation of church and state in politics, which means that religion is not meant to be involved in politics, number one. Number two, in reality... You know, anybody who's actually communicated with spirit, their own spirit self, uh, the the big big mind or cosmic consciousness, God, whatever you want to call that, generally understands that you don't do that through looking at the sky. Um, <laughs> or, you know, the, the, this idea of a sky god is just, I would say he's either lost the plot or he's playing up to Christians in America, basically, and probably doesn't even believe what he's saying. He's just saying it to get them on his side. So it's very challenging to assess Donald Trump's state of being because he fundamentally lies a lot. He's, I would say, lies more than most people. And if you listen to uh, actually his biographer, unofficial biographer, and also the guy who he had ghostwrite The Art of the Deal for him, both of them, in fact, um, Tony Schwartz, who wrote that Art of the Deal, spent, I think it was six months with Trump and was shocked to see how much Trump would let him into his private conversations when it was obvious to him that he was lying and only giving half-truths and had a terrible problem with focusing and retaining information, that kind of thing. He was shocked that Trump would even let him see this side of him, but he did. 
given that he does warp the truth significantly a lot, it can be difficult to understand when he says things, whether they are actually what he really thinks or whether it's just part of a ploy to manipulate someone somewhere. And that in itself is a dysfunction, obviously. And within politics, you know, that's, although it's not meant to be how things go, that's not what we want politicians to do. That's kind of standard practice. And it, it's almost stereotypical that people who gain political power tend to be extremely manipulative. And that's why we need to monitor them so carefully. Ultimately, one of the reasons, because it's just totally obvious. I mean, <laughs> in Britain, anyway, we've got many, many, many dramas and sitcoms outlining this reality and the stereotypical image of politicians as two-faced lying manipulators and you know that's what I see when I look at Donald Trump and I, and I think as we're going to get into by listening to some actual specialist psychologists and so on um, there is definitely a kind of what people have called Dunning-Kruger effect going on here and for those of you who don't know I actually realized this phenomenon before I was even an adult I never heard of it as being given a name before but it's true that people with a lower level of intelligence than other people sometimes look at the people with higher intelligence and think that they're stupid because the things those people are saying don't make sense to them. And because they think that they themselves are intelligent, they're unable to recognise the value in what other people are saying and therefore artificially determine that they are the intelligent one and the other people are lacking intelligence. Now, obviously, this is a challenging thing to address because anyone looking at that situation, oh, there's person A can think that they're more intelligent than they are and think that person B is dumb when they aren't because they can't understand person B's position. Well, most people are going to try and put themselves in the position of person B, who's the intelligent one. They're not going to want to put themselves in the position of person one thinking they're the, they're, they're the not intelligent one, obviously. So it's difficult to erase this subject and it really just comes down to in a lot of ways, each individual being honest with themselves and just recognising whether they really do understand something or not. You know, are they the person that is the expert engineer in something that's managed to make something that other people haven't made? Are they the artist that's had world recognition? Are they, you know, successful in what they're talking about in that field? Or are they talking about putting down somebody who has success in that field when they themselves don't have any success in that field? That should be quite telling really shouldn't it if you've got no success in a field and you're putting down people with success in a field you should have a clue that maybe they know more than you do or at the very least you've got some way to go to demonstrate why your different opinion on things is actually the better one just because you don't go along with the herd and you don't have success in society doesn't make you wrong it could make you more right than everyone else and everyone else is actually wrong but it does help a lot if you've had you know, some sort of success in that field to some extent, in some way, or can at least prove what you're saying. And very often people who put other people down extensively in specialist fields often, A, don't have any experience that they can prove, B, are unable to demonstrate what they're talking about. So I'm going to be careful here, obviously, when I talk about this subject, because I, as I said, I don't have any qualifications in psychology. I don't have a background as a therapist. So, you know, I could easily find myself falling foul of that whole equation that I just laid out. But I'm going to do my best to explain here as we go why I'm confident in talking about this. And literally, I have spent 15 years at least thinking about this problem and carefully adapting the way that I think and what I say and do so that I don't fall foul of that. It's entirely possible that I can uh, become a bit grandiose, perhaps, in some people's perspectives, and sometimes people do accuse me of things like that. There's All I can do is listen to them, take it in, and, and assess whether or not what they're saying is true or not. I don't really get the feeling that, that people with pathological narcissism, which is what we're actually about to be talking about here, have that capacity. They don't really listen to other people. They don't really take it in. They don't really ask the question, well, are these people right? Am I really crossing a line here where I've become totally overblown in myself uh, and and so on? And, and I think Donald Trump, like many leaders in history, falls into that category. So we're looking here at page on Newsweek, which uh, just goes through this whole point about him talking about himself as a chosen one. There's also uh, some tweets which he retweeted from a guy basically saying that Jews think of Donald Trump as being like the king of Israel. And he sort of retweeted that and said, thanks. Now, you know, people in the media have 
phrased this as if he himself said that about himself, which isn't exactly true. He didn't come out on a stage and say, I'm the king of Israel. But at the end of the day, retweeting that tweet and saying thanks, I mean, he might just see it as this sort of PR where, oh, good, people can see that people in Israel like me kind of thing. The flip side to that is that you are basically saying you agree with it. I mean, if someone said that about me and I wanted to be known as being popular in Israel, I still wouldn't just retweet it and say thanks. I'd say, you know, I'd laugh probably and say uh, something like, oh, thanks for the kind words. Uh, you know, I don't really see myself as a king, something like that. But he didn't say that. He just said thanks, which, you know, is what you would say if you see yourself as a king. And, and it really does seem like he has one of the biggest, most imbalanced egos on the planet right now. So I'm just going to play a few clips from this video here because it's actually addressing what I want to cover in the rest of this session. And basically, there's a book that was written uh, a few years ago where originally 27 different mental health specialists commented on Donald Trump. And they said, ordinarily, we wouldn't do that because we have certain policies in place where we won't comment on somebody in the public's mental health. Uh, but in this case, we we perceive that our obligation to protect the public is more important and more necessary than uh, our obligation, let's say, or our policy to not speak on the mental health of public figures. Now they've updated the book and it now has 37 quite high, high uh, qualified mental professionals in there talking about the subject. So that's what this video is about. I'm going to show you a few few minutes from that. Raving lunatic. He is not well. Those are not my words. Those are the words of Andrew Gillum, the former Democratic mayor of Tallahassee, who came in second in last year's race for governor in Florida. He was echoing what has become mainstream thinking now about the mental health of the president of the United States during a week in which the president has said he is the king of the Jews the second coming of God, the chosen one. It is the same week in which, even though he sees himself as a king, a God, a chosen one, Denmark somehow found the strength to defy him and refuse to sell Greenland to the United States. And so the president, the king, the God, says he canceled the trip to Denmark, even though he probably canceled the trip to Denmark because he knows President Obama is scheduled to go to Denmark a few weeks after what would have been the Trump trip and President Obama would surely get a much more positive reception from a much, much bigger crowd than Donald Trump could have mustered in Denmark. All of that sounds pretty crazy to sober, careful politicians like Andrew Gillum, who have never before called a political opponent a raving lunatic. Well... We told you so. One month into the Trump presidency, we had our first discussion of the president's mental health on this program with psychologist John Gartner and former professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, Lance Dotis. If we could construct a psychiatric Frankenstein monster, we could not create a leader more dangerously mentally ill than Donald Trump. He's a paranoid, psychopathic narcissist who's divorced from reality and lashes out impulsively at his imagined enemies. He lies because of his sociopathic tendencies that Dr. Gartner was talking about, that he lies in the way anybody who scams people does, that he's trying to sell uh, an idea or a product by telling you something that's untrue. There's that lying. There's also the kind of lying he has that is, uh, in a way, more serious that he has a loose grip on reality. If he was a paranoid schizophrenic and he was wearing a tinfoil hat, then he wouldn't be elected president. But he's just sane enough, as it were, to uh, pass, but actually detached from reality, as Dr. Dota said, so that what is real uh, is fluid. Uh, it's totally um, uh, malleable, according to his personality disorder. Later that year, Dr. Gartner and Dr. Dotas contributed articles to the book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, 27 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess a President. A new edition of that book was published this year with 10 more entries, which then changed the subtitle to 37 Psychiatrists and Mental Health Experts Assess a President. In that book, Dr. Dotas writes, Mr. Trump's sociopathic characteristics are undeniable. They create a profound danger for America's democracy and safety. Over time, these characteristics will only become worse. And joining our discussion now, once again, is Dr. Lance Dotas, a former assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. And 
Okay, so we get the picture there and you're, it's worth watching the rest of that video because this is actually quite a good interview, but I'm not going to play it all here. So if we move on here, this is just another tweet that popped up. It's just uh, an amusing one on Facebook. Um, I mean, that's pretty much the perspective of a lot of people, I think. They just see the whole thing as absurd and ridiculous, but even this situation is is pushing it for what they would have expected from Trump. Uh, and this is actually a clip of him. Saying, I'm not doing this. Somebody said it's Trump's trade war. This isn't my trade war. This is a trade war that should have taken place a long time ago by a lot of other presidents. Over the last five or six years, China's made five hundred billion dollars. Five hundred billion ripped it out of the United States. And not only that, if you take a look, intellectual property theft, add that to it and add a lot of other things to it. So somebody, excuse me, somebody had to do it. I am the chosen one. Somebody had to do it. So I'm taking on China. I'm taking. Right. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's done. You could say it's done in a kind of lighthearted way. But if it was your grandfather saying it at a party in the summer, you know, for fun, then everyone would laugh. Ha ha, funny guy, granddad, you know, he thinks he's talking to God and God's telling him to, you know, make the barbecue or whatever. But that's not this, is it? This is literally somebody potentially able to start wars and one of the most closely scrutinized people on the planet. And, you know, one of the other speakers in one of these videos related to all of this makes the point that at one point he, he referred to the leader of North Korea as rocket man and really kind of putting him down. And they had this, you know, kind of dumb uh, conflict over the web where the North Korean leader described him as a doltard, basically really used quite high level English language to make him sound like an imbecile. And then not long after Trump's then saying, oh, I love I love him. We have a we have a, you know, an excellent relationship now and all this kind of stuff. Now, you know, people behind this, pe people who are Trump fans tend to view that as this. Oh, it's all, you know, he's making moves behind the scenes and he's cut a really good deal now. He must be really helping us. He's got one over on North Korea. Yeah. So now he's just publicly being seen to show that he likes him and all this kind of stuff. It's all just stage managed acting. And in a way, that is the case. But. Here's the thing. It's the borderline point, isn't it? It's the pe people who are very anti-political um, correctness tend to view his stage antics as being this kind of undercurrent sarcasm against political correctness and against um, their traditional kind of conservative view on things. And they see it as funny in a way. They, you know, that's why that's why basically Trump seemingly can do no wrong for a lot of people because when he does things that a large number of people consider to be extremely disturbing, the kind of non-PC right wing people tend to view that as just amusing and him playing up to the cameras in a way. And I think there is an element of that. But as I said, the issue is he's basically in a position to potentially start wars that could end the entire planet and the history of everything on this planet. So. You know, it's not. It's good to have. <laughs> it's good to have a sense of humour, but it's also good to present real balance to the world and wisdom rather than um, dysfunction. And really, I think it's more what he puts across to me is much more on the in the realms of dysfunction than anything that I find entertaining. And if I want to watch comedy, I'll go and watch a comedian, right? So uh, this is one of the main kind of diagnosis that the psychologists involved have attributed to Donald Trump. And I actually have a book here called The Madness of George W. Bush, which I bought a few years ago by Paul Levy. And in that book, he goes through a similar breakdown of, of George Bush and basically says the same thing about him, says that he's narcissistic. Um, and if we read through what's in here briefly on Wikipedia, uh, NPD is a personality disorder with a long-term pattern of abnormal behaviour characterised by exaggerated feelings of self-importance, excessive need for admiration and a lack of empathy. So for me, you know, my I always point out that healing requires empathy. It requires the emotional presence to understand yourself and other people so that you can have balance in yourself, you can respect yourself, you can respect others, you cannot push anyone's boundaries that they don't want pushed uh, unless they're pushing on your boundaries and you need to do that. And obviously a politician basically is just a scaled up version of an average person in the sense that we all have to deal with our boundaries with other people. 
we all have to deal with some degree of trading with other people and interacting and so on. And really a president on a certain level is doing that on a global level. So he's dealing or she is dealing with similar problems that we deal with on a daily basis, but much more amplified. And so it's understandable that they're going to have a higher level of stress and that their psychological dysfunctions might become more apparent. But at the same time, it's also necessary that they have a much greater level of focus on solving this within themselves than the average person does, really, in a way, because their choices affect so many more people. And I don't feel that Trump has that intention on any level. In fact, he's fighting against it. And whenever people comment on his issues and why it might be a good idea for us to look at them or for him to change, he kind of fights back against that, gets aggressive and, and attacks people, basically, because he's not willing to accept that he has failings and that he actually needs to look at these areas of denied consciousness within him like we all do. And that ties in very much to this um, exaggerated feelings of self-importance. If, if you view, now, even if you are the president of America, it's still possible to have exaggerated feelings of self-importance. You can still view yourself as being above the position that the, ultimately the nation allegedly has put you into. In reality, the structure of politics in America and most of the world is so corrupt that it doesn't really ever represent the people. But setting that aside, if we look at it from the official mainstream narrative of things that he was voted in and he's elected and the people want him there and so on, or a certain percentage of them do, it's still possible to be overblown in your own mind and then therefore to not to listen to people. And there are lots of examples of advisors being sacked by him of all levels, of all kinds. And there's another story which I saw recently where they were actually interviewing people who had been working at the White House and had to brief Trump and other people like that throughout their career and basically said that he is notorious for not listening to people if he doesn't like what they're saying, doesn't even take it in, he just sacks them, basically. And that's not how you run a democratic government, ultimately. A democracy is meant to be a distribution of power to some extent, although it's very centralised. It's still meant to be decentralised enough that you don't have a dictator. And that's really what the main concern, I think, is of a lot of people who look at this, because the equation that we see in Donald Trump is not that far away from a dictator. In fact, if you look at dictators throughout history, often, you know, they started out doing similar things to this and gradually a little change here, a little change there. And the policies changed to the point where they centralized power more and more and more to the point where it was very difficult for anyone to dislodge them. And it only really takes a kind of undying loyalty to that person amongst police, military and um, secret services, let's say, for the country to become fascistic authoritarian and a complete nightmare and it doesn't matter how many times he claims that he's on the side of freedom and so on you know that it can ultimately just be empty words can't it his actions are important not words if we just skim through this a bit more those affected often spend much time thinking about achieving power or success or on their appearance they often take advantage of the people around them so obviously you look at trump think about his history you know he's always talking about how he's the best at everything there's videos that i'm not going to show now but there's literally videos that have taken clips from his career where it's just scene after scene after scene after scene after scene after scene after scene of him saying nobody knows more than donald trump about this nobody knows more than me about that nobody knows more about taxes than me i mean the things that he comes out with they couldn't all be true it's just not possible there is no one person i'm pretty sure who is an expert on pretty much every subject to the point where the world's top expert now, I'm somebody who likes to study a lot of subjects, and I do consider myself an expert in a few subjects, but I definitely wouldn't consider myself to be expert in a huge array of subjects, and I definitely wouldn't even claim that I was the top genius person on any one subject in the world. For a start, because I don't even know everyone in the world. There are billions of people. So it's literally impossible for me to know that I am, or anyone is, the best in a certain field. So as soon as I hear people saying that, not once, not twice, but countless times you know for anybody who who understands any anything about psychology it's easy to recognize that that that's a major red flag with regards to these kinds of dysfunctions of delusions and denials it's not a joke to say that it's not a joke to to, to use as an argument or a position this fallacy that you're the world's biggest expert and ultimately people who don't see that and don't recognize that that's a big problem probably are equally delusional and that's equally what this psychiatrist which i'll show you shortly also says you know i've i'm somebody who uh rebels very much against mainstream positions on most subjects 
and I definitely don't agree with much of the common government oriented let's say mainstream perspectives on psychology and on many subjects but often I do agree completely with many leading experts or academics because they, they know what they're talking about and they're right and and we both reach the same conclusion um, so here are some of the tweets that he put out on uh, on trade tariffs with China that people have been writing about recently basically saying you know he's, he's starting a kind of trade war with China now you know that's a matter of politics I'm not going to get too into that I'm, you know, <laughs> I could talk all day along about um, the financial system and how it's totally corrupt and literally the entire process of creating money in America is fraudulent and criminal and Britain and most other places. And all of this stuff to do with numbers and trade and taxes and all this stuff is all bullshit, really, because ultimately, you know, you've got multi-trillion dollar alleged debt that's all fictitious and they're acting as if it's all real and, you know, accounting for their nation's economies based on figures that are all based in fraud and nonsense to begin with. So it's ridiculous. But people are highlighting, though, that this kind of position that he takes with China, uh, you know, it's like he's um, having a sort of playground fight with, with a bully or something like that. And it's hard to tell sometimes in those situations who's the bully and who isn't. Um, so this is the book that we're going to come on to, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. And this is 37 different psychiatrists now, originally 27, commenting on his mental health. And I, I don't have this book, but, um, or they've written 35 on here, 37 on there. I'm not sure why that is, but it doesn't really matter too much. So these are all different essays from different people. Um, and I did notice that um, Tony Schwartz is in there, who, as far as I know, is not an actual, um, any kind of psychological specialist. So this is, yeah, he wrote this, I wrote The Art of the Deal. So he's just, um, describing from his own direct experience with Trump, living with him basically for a while, how he's like, which is, you know, it's fair enough. He's probably one of the few people to have done that and openly talking about it. He's probably the only person I can see in here who doesn't have some sort of doctor or PhD after their name as well. I think he is, yeah. So this is a breakdown and, and you know, they're, they're literally looking point by point at the various different psychological aspects that are visible in Donald Trump and how that applies to the society as well. And we're going to see shortly an interview with um, Bandy Lee, who basically wrote this book, put it together, uh, of why it's important to consider that this is not just an issue of Donald Trump, it's an issue of the nation and the world in general that supports him. Um, and that's really what this is all about. And if you look through on Amazon, the reviews for this, there's you know a large number of reviews, and most of them are five-star, people really loving it, thinking it's... You know, really excellent piece of work, very important. And then obviously also there's some negative ones, and I, you know, I look at those as well, and we will do shortly. In fact, I want to look at them now. So, top positive review. This is one of the best reads I've had all year, for it paints an in-depth picture of the pathology that afflicts our current president, as described by a panel of psychiatrists and psychologists mating, uh, meeting at a Yale symposium. Indeed, I made a list of the personality disorders described for him and kept it on my phone. It's a wonderful reference guide to explain the truly screwed up behaviour Trump shows daily. Much of it is expected, e.g. malignant narcissism, which I should point out is not actually a fully recognised diagnosis. But also much to me is new, e.g. a present hedonist who cares not who came, what came before or what will come after, but only about what's happening now and how it affects him. So, you know, that's something you, you will see in so-called spiritual groups often as well, where people take this idea of living in the present moment and then warp it and deny reality by kind of saying, well, the past and the future don't matter. They don't even exist. Don't even think about them. It's only about now. And I'm here to meet my needs and have desires. So therefore, it's all about me and what I want right now. And nothing else is important. Um, and you see that in, you know, so-called spoilt children. Basically, people who uh, are often coming from a very wealthy background who are used to getting exactly what they want when they want it because they've got the money to pay for people to make it happen. And I think that's a, probably an accurate description of him. So it says here also the wrap on the book comes from the academic physicians who cite the Goldwater rule, which says you shouldn't diagnose a person's pathology unless you examine them directly. And this guy, whoever it is, says I'm an academic and I can assure you otherwise. And blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to come back to that in a moment um, because it's actually addressed by the book's author in an interview. And then you can see the most negative review here. This book is a complete and utter disgrace. The number one rule as a psychiatrist and psychologist is to understand one's own counter transference and one's own projectioning. Every rule is broken here. Every rule that facilitates an accurate and objective perception. I'm annoyed with hearing irrational arguments about why it's okay to abandon previous standards of journalism and other standards of professional conduct in the case of Donald Trump. 
This is the definition of prejudice. This is nonsense. I'm going to go through briefly why that's nonsense. So, first of all, projectioning and countertransference. Now, you know, maybe many people aren't aware of those terms. They are very, very important when you're trying to understand psychology of yourself and other people, specifically when you're trying to heal yourself. Uh, and it is common, as I understand it, for professionals to go through extensive periods of working on themselves to heal their own issues before they even start helping other people. It's very important. It's necessary. And often projectioning is ultimately where you're taking your own issues on some level and projecting them out as if it's someone else who has those issues. And this is obviously a very challenging thing to think about and process because, again, as with the Dunning-Kruger effect of identifying who is and isn't intelligent, is it you or is it the other person who's dumb, if you want to use that word, not really the right word, but I like to use language which kind of bridges intellectual type thinking and common language because I think these subjects need to be understood by everyone. I do also try not to judge in the process of that and dumb is a judgment so I release that, I apologise. <laughs> um, but yeah, similar to, to that kind of difficulty in assessing the intelligence of other people in relation to yourself, it's also difficult sometimes to understand who began the problem that you're looking at. Who is the one who is demonstrating a psychological dysfunction? Sometimes it's obvious because you're doing absolutely nothing, you're being peaceful and someone else is acting out in an obvious way. But sometimes when you're getting into complex matters and opinions come in and beliefs and so on, you may not even really fully understand your own belief systems and all the other persons and it can become challenging to know whether you're put, putting a problem down to being caused by someone else or whether you yourself are causing it. In this case, I haven't read this book so I can't really fully comment. However, what I do recognise is that there are so many issues with Trump that I can see that are the kind of issues that I've dug quite deeply into in myself and I'm fairly confident when I say that I'm not projecting some of the things that he's demonstrating um, that I find this quite absurd but particularly moving on to this point uh, I'm annoyed with hearing irrational arguments about why it's okay to abandon previous standards of journalism and other standards of professional conduct in the single case of Donald Trump well, this isn't just in the case of Donald Trump. You know, there are people who have made these kind of comments about many people in the past before, as I said, with regards to the Bush book I've got here and so on. Um, and their, their, their argument for doing that is basically that he is so out of balance and has the potential to cause so many problems that it would be unethical not to speak out about it. And I've often, as a child, thought about Adolf Hitler, for example, growing up in a family where my ancestors were in World War II and talked about it a lot, I often thought, how did someone like Hitler do what he did? I mean, it's amazing that so many people got behind him when he was... I mean, there are many Hitler apologists who will disagree with me, but from my perspective, you know, even if, even if you think that a, a significant perspective of what's told about Germany during that time was lies, uh, and some of it probably was, but even if you think that, in order to stand up for Hitler, you're still standing up for an authoritarian dictator, ultimately, which is ridiculous. Uh, but, but when I used to think about Hitler, I used to think, well, what if I was alive at the time and I had the chance to kill him and I knew I was there? Would it be wrong to kill him, knowing that if I killed him, millions of people might be saved? And, you know, it's an interesting question, isn't it? And, and I think I have to say, if I knew for certain that that was true, that it's not wrong to kill him, basically, because, you know, <laughs> you've, you've... The overall balance of good versus evil let's say is that generally speaking you've done more good by killing that person um so yeah it's it's a very challenging thing obviously i would be looking for a solution that doesn't involve killing him but at the end of the day if no one's listening to you and he's not listening to you there's only so much you can do right so and i'm not saying that i'm not this isn't a call for violence against donald trump or anything like that or anyone my point is that there are rules which people would normally have such as don't kill people which we need to break sometimes because of the unusual situation we find ourselves in. And I, and I see that's a little bit what's happening here with psychologists who see so obviously problems with Donald Trump. Normally they wouldn't speak about it, but they can't live with themselves if they don't speak about it. Uh, there's also a comment here about... Um, ban I mean, this in itself is, I think, it's projection. You know, <laughs> it's, it's so funny, um, in a way. Uh, there are plenty of narcissists in the world especially Ivy League university academics authoring this work. Bandy Lee is a nobody. Well, is she? Let's have a look. Um, educated at Yale, 
Well, okay, that puts you in the top percentages of, of education anyway, straight away. Um, born in the Bronx, okay. So her career. Lee interned at the Bellevue Hospital Centre in New York, chief resident in Massachusetts General Hospital. Received her MD from Yale in 1994 and her MDiv, I'm not even sure what that is. Oh, okay, a divinity qualification. She then studied the anthropology of violence in East Africa as a fellow of the National Institute of Mental Health, co-authored academic papers, specialist in violence prevention programs in prisons and the community, worked for several years in maximum security prisons, instrumental in initiating reforms in New York's Rikers Island jail complex. Um, since then, she consulted with five different U.S. states on prison reform. She was director of research for the Center of the Study on Violence um, and with Cave, Cave Shonud, probably butchered that name, founded Yale University's Violence and Health Study Group. She heads a project group of the Violence Prevention Alliance for the World Health Organization and wrote the textbook Violence, an Interdisciplinary Approach to Causes, Consequences and Cures. So definitely not a nobody. You know, you, you might say that she's not at the pinnacle of her... Um, field but she's definitely near the top I would say uh, as a percentage compared to the average psychologist compared to the average person so for this reviewer to say she's a nobody ironically whilst also talking about narcissism and prejudice hmm funny that isn't it um it says here holding no active medical license as she claims nor anywhere well I can't comment on that maybe that's true I haven't seen her claim that and I haven't you know I can't comment on it but um just because one gets 27 other unprofessional, non-objective friend colleagues together uh, from the NYC site community and collectively do a wrong does not make it right. So it's basically trying to sort of reject that she has any qualification for making these claims and that all of the other people, all of the other doctors and specialists are basically meaningless because they all come from New York. I mean, that's not logical. It doesn't stand up to any examination. It's frankly absurd. Uh, I haven't even looked at these comments, but there's 28 comments under here. <laughs> okay, Ivanka, whatever you say. <laughs> um, you're wrong. I shudder when I think of what you would have written or not about a book, Ari, regarding Adolf Hitler. That's pretty much what I was just saying. So, um, your entire review on this book is an attack on the authors. You go after credentials, professional reputation, and ethics, all wrapped up in a paragraph, a stream of consciousness, angst, conveying blistering rage and frustration. Um, so, yeah, basically, gladly, mostly people are recognizing what I'm saying. So, um, this is her page on the Yale School of Medicine, um, you know, assistant clinical professor, basically. So, no, definitely not a nobody. And, you know, that's ridiculous. So here's uh, a few minutes of interview with her. And then I'm just going to close out with some of what I think about this, um, which is, you know, not so much what you're hearing from these videos, but I think is equally important. Welcome to the France 24 interview. Now, what if you knew a truth about someone that harbored dangers of such magnitude that it could be the key to future human survival. And now, what if that someone happened to be the President of the United States? And what if you were expected to keep your mouth shut about it? Well, that was one of the dilemmas facing Yale psychiatrist Bandy X. Lee, um, who was one of the contributors of essays to a controversial new book called The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump. Now, Lee defied many of her own peers, Lee and her colleagues, arguing that their, quote, duty to warn the world about Trump's mental instability must supersede professional neutrality. And uh, Bandy Lee joins me uh, from New York. You're a forensic psychologist. You're also an expert in, uh, in violence. Uh, thank you so much for taking some time to be with us today. I Thank you for having me. Yeah, Dr. Lee, I, I want to ask you this. The ethical question is the first one. I know you grappled with it a lot. There is something called the Goldwater Rule in the American Psych Psychiatric Association. I know you talk about this a lot. It basically says it's unethical to share a professional opinion about a public figure unless you have personally examined them. You made a conscious decision to sort of override that rule, to supersede it. Why and what were the compelling reasons? First of all, if I may, I'd like to make clear that I'm speaking on my own behalf and not representing the views of my institutions, that is Yale University, Yale School of Medicine, and Yale Department of Psychiatry. As for the ethical question, in fact, the Goldwater Rule is rather complex. Uh, I'm actually a proponent of the rule, uh, but there are two parts to it. One is not to diagnose a public figure without having personally examined them and gotten consent from them. Uh, and secondly, it is when one is asked about a public figure, uh, psychiatrists are actually encouraged 
to educate the public about relevant psychiatric matters in general terms. Um, and actually, that is exactly what the book is doing. We do not diagnose, and we try to educate the public as to all the possible conditions that could be relevant, uh, all the situations that uh, tie into the dangerousness that we see. When we do speak about Mr. Trump in particular, uh, we are referring to another ethical duty, which is the duty to warn, uh, duty to report or to warn or to protect others or the public in the case of a danger, in the case of an emergency. Could you, yeah, um, Dr. Lee, could you tell us more specifically, I'm curious about this myself, how do you, your, your, your contributors in the book, they found things ranging from narcissism to hedonism, fragile sense of self-esteem, lack of trust in himself. How do you detect and how do you, I, I won't say diagnose, but how do you detect these signs of behavior when you're not diagnosing in person? Person. So um, everyone wants a diagnosis. It would be irresponsible to say if um, without having all the information. But assessing danger does not require all information. It only requires enough information to raise alarms so that we call for a full evaluation. Um, in terms of all the, uh, all the possible conditions that were outlined in the book, uh, those are, uh, we try to be comprehensive in terms of the important possibilities. Uh, but there, there's also a fair amount we can know uh, about the president. Give, give us we a few of those, seen... yeah. What, what are a few of the signs that you've, you've seen? Yes, so uh, while we have not examined him in person, uh, we have seen a lot of behaviors in, uh, in public in, in response to situations in real time, over quite a bit of time. So actually, uh, uh, these behaviors or responses, uh, uh, incitement um, of the public, uh, effects on the public, these are kinds of things that uh, we actually have a lot more information on him about than than any patient. What? what uh, could I? Could I just had. jump in, uh, Dr. Lee? What would you say? Because the word da the dangerous case, the word dangerous is in there. What would you say are among the more the more dangerous signs that are brought up by some of mm -hmm. the psychiatrists writing um, essays for this book? Yes. Yeah, so um, so well. Uh, the essays cover a lot, uh, but as an expert on violence, I can tell you that uh, previous violence um, shows an indication for possible future violence, and he has already shown verbal aggressiveness, uh, history of sexual assault, incitement to violence at his rallies, uh, endorsement of violence in public speeches, and he's shown an attraction to violence and powerful weapons, as well as he has taunted hostile nations with nuclear power. All these things are signs of danger. And uh, because assessing dangerousness is more about the situation than about the person, uh, he is definitely in a situation where more of this could come and actually could escalate. We make a lot of, a lot of people have commented on the fact, obviously, he's the leader of the free world. He has his finger, uh, Dr. Lee, on the nuclear button. How, how dangerous is that? Is there, did you see a sign of danger of such a man having control over the nuclear codes? And, and what are they? Uh, yes, absolutely. That is our primary, most urgent concern, although not our only concern. Uh, he has shown characteristics that would make one uh, certainly more um, precarious in such a position. He has shown impulsivity, recklessness, paranoia, or perceiving threat where it doesn't exist. Um, he has shown uh, a loose, having a loose grip on reality, uh, where real consequences will matter very little. Uh, he's shown a lack of empathy, where uh, devastation to, uh, to millions of people may not be of great concern to him. Uh, he's shown rage reactions and a constant need to burnish a sense of power uh, in response to what seems to be a pattern of uh, inner insecurities and, and uh, fear of feeling small or worthless, powerless. That, 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 that's quite a, a long, an, a lengthy list there. It's interesting because you point out at one point, I believe in the, perhaps in the book's introduction, that despite its title, this book is not really a, so much about Donald Trump as about, and I think your words were, the larger context that has given rise to his presidency. Mm -hmm. I, I read that and I was thinking, there's, a, there's an insinuation there that if Donald Trump is mentally unstable, as a lot of the, the psychiatrists here suggest, the people who elected him might also have elements of mental instability. Am, am I reading too much into that? 
Um, uh, no, that's, that's precisely the situation that concerns us about uh, the public mental health in general, in addition to its security and safety. Um, Mr. Trump, uh, while he is uh, our greatest urgency at this time, um, having the mental signs of mental instability and impairment that he does, but there is also a reason why uh, a mentally impaired leader was elected to this office. Even though uh, he wasn't elected by a majority, uh, he did have enough votes to be elected. and. Uh, the book goes into some length uh, as to how such a leader uh, could have been attractive uh, to the public because, uh, you know, a poor state of mental health would make one more vulnerable to those who are exhibiting signs of mental impairment, uh, would, uh, uh, would shield them from seeing the signs of the dangers, and also uh, there's, uh, there's a kind of mental mechanism that happens where you're attracted to to pathology when there, there are elements of pathology the, that you're suffering from. There's a sort of symbiosis at work here. I think there was one uh, writer, maybe it was yourself, who said that. So Donald Trump is mad, and the madness is catching. And I suppose that there is that sort of um, snowball effect when you have a leader such as this in the White House. Yes, that was a publisher. Um, uh, yes, we certainly is seeing, uh, we certainly are seeing uh, effects of mental impairment spread, so pathology is spreading, as well as uh, as well as uh, an effect of of a poor state of mental health to begin with. So I'm just going to end that there, and really, this comes back to understanding that we're one. There is a collective consciousness. Ultimately, it doesn't mean to say that you're not an individual and that I'm not an individual, but we all do reflect each other, and if one person personifies and and really reflects strongly certain dysfunctions to everyone else there's going to be a percentage of people who see that clearly because they recognize that dysfunction and they've hopefully addressed it themselves already but there's also going to be a percentage of people who don't recognize it don't understand it and who have it as a result of that and that ultimately means that there are these windows of opportunity for dysfunctional people to gain power and the more people who are mentally ill or not diagnosed, ultimately, or don't fix it in themselves, the more chance there is of a person like them gaining power. And this is a huge issue, is why individually we all need to, and what, just one of the reasons why individually we need to really become aware of psychology, not necessarily academic psychology, but the reality of psychology within ourselves and other people, be excruciatingly honest and transparent with ourselves and, and be open to the possibility that we have a wide array of our own issues that we need to address, whether it be belief systems, emotional injuries, um, areas within ourselves that we're blocking out and so on behind trauma walls even. All of these things need to be addressed and healed for us to be the best versions of ourselves and also to not empower other people who are then going to go out and cause great destruction in the world. Now, people might say, well, Donald Trump hasn't caused great destruction in the world. He hasn't started any wars. Well, as I understand it, America is at war with numerous places simultaneously. And, yeah, he hasn't started a new giant campaign like some other world leaders have done. But I can feel that that's exactly the kind of thing he would probably do in certain circumstances. He ultimately puts forward and projects a kind of image of a father, this sort of successful father who knows exactly what to do. He's got the best of everything. You know, can't believe you'd even question him. And uh, it's just an authority figure, isn't it? It's like a stereotypical bully. Uh, you know, removing press credentials from people who say things you don't like, that kind of thing. It's not, that's not transparent. It's not even fair or balanced or honest or anything like that. It's basically authoritarian and the actions of a tyrant, uh, the kind of person whose children would be probably quite psychologically harmed by that. And I think the fact that there are images of his two sons, uh, two of his sons anyway, uh, holding up dead leopards and that kind of thing that they've gone and hunted and shot themselves, like smiling, like they've just you know, achieve something amazing when they've really just done nothing of any use to anyone. Basically, it's, it, this is telling. And, you know, they haven't, they're not well known for going out and saving lives or um, really dramatically improving the world, as far as I'm aware. I think the idea of billionaires being philanthropic and using their money to help the world is, it's not that that's really what they're doing. It's really just often a way of them covering up the fact that they've taken a huge amount of the world's wealth.
and used it for things which didn't help anyone and if they use a small percentage of it to kind of cover that over then they can get away with it so what can we do about this well my solution to all political problems is not to support politics i don't vote for anyone i don't support any political parties i don't really recommend that anyone thinks that government is a good idea i personally view that the concept of not having a ruler is a much better idea i don't need to be ruled and no one needs to be ruled if they're self-empowered and is able to act intelligently and with wisdom and ultimately a planet covered in wise people is far 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 superior to one with a few allegedly strong leaders i think i think the idea of a strong leader is itself an oxymoron it's it's backwards because basically anybody who's smart enough knows you need to have everybody enlightened and aware able to stand on their own two feet and a leader doesn't achieve that a leader is the opposite of that a leader requires followers followers by definition are not exactly self-empowered so there's these fairly simple principles that people just need to get into their minds to figure things out for themselves and realize what's true and what isn't and you're never going to hear this from mainstream media because they're all part of that system designed to keep an artificial power hierarchy in place so you're never going to hear them saying, oh, well, maybe anarchy is a good idea. Maybe we should be self-empowered. Maybe we shouldn't be giving our power away to these people in pyramids. They don't say that because they're all benefiting in one way or another financially from that situation. Most of these people, many of them, in a situation where everyone was self-empowered, wouldn't have a job. You wouldn't be going and watching mainstream news to get your information because you wouldn't need them because everyone would be intelligent enough that it would be decentralized and you could trust the information you got and it would be proven over and over again to be right. You wouldn't need to be going to these so-called authority figures on mainstream media. So in a sense, this problem of Donald Trump's mental health and the mental health of any leader really comes down to the question of centralization versus decentralization. The more we decentralize power, the less of a problem all of this becomes. There are many interesting challenges along that road, such as, for example, nuclear weapons. Uh, how can you have a decentralized um access to nuclear weapons does that mean that people get to directly vote on whether to launch a nuclear missile i mean that's quite a frightening thought isn't it um does it mean that everyone gets to have their own nuclear missile i mean personally i think that we need to recognize the reality of life on this planet and it's quite fragile in a lot of ways and the fact that anybody has a nuclear missile is a problem so society needs to take it upon itself to really enlighten itself and to educate our children more intelligently as to what life is itself and how we need to protect it in order just to be able to continue having thoughts about what to do with it. Making life and survival the top priority includes the life and survival of others because as soon as you start to attack other people there's more chance that you'll be attacked and there's more chance that you're going to destroy everything. So peace must be the highest priority, full stop. And we don't see that in Donald Trump. We don't see that in governments of the West in general we see them constantly trying to use force and violence as some sort of father figure to squash other people and make it seem like they're the best and greatest person. If you've killed everyone else, then sure, you are the best and greatest person because there's no one else left, right? And, and I think that's, to some extent, the absurdity of the logic that some of these people are using. They just don't think with their emotions, with their heart, enough to know what's actually true and how absurd the mental logic they're using actually is. So with all of that, you know, it doesn't mean to say that there's no progressive possible outcome here. The potential is for us to use any other person as a reflection to learn from, to really understand psychology that much more and realise when we've been taken advantage of, where we've been misled and where we've misled ourselves and others into thinking statements made by other people and certain ideas just aren't true and that the evidence doesn't hold them up and basically to recognise when we're being lied to. And I now, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, but now even more have taken to meditating into my own emotions more and more and more, to shutting off my mind, stopping taking in information from the internet and so on, and just feeling and, and really listening to my feelings because my feelings are the ones that guide me to the truth often of what is coming from another person and from myself and the truth of a situation. When a person says something but act in an opposite way or when they're, you can just tell that what they're saying doesn't match up with what they're thinking, it's your feelings often that will identify that to you. And children are usually very good at doing that. And as they get older and trained by this backward system through schools and mass media, that ability gets sort of rubbed out of them. And they're taught to believe what they're told from other people instead of what they feel is really true. And that's that's really a big part of this problem. 
until children are allowed to develop freely without being overpowered at school and forced to accept certain things as being true, which actually aren't true, and which their feelings tell them aren't true, we're going to continue having this problem of, of societies who can't tell what is true and who support politicians and other people who really are not in their best interests. So yeah, I'll stop this here. I, I, these these subjects I literally can talk for hours, days, even weeks. You know, I could happily do a nine hour video on these subjects because they touch into so many different realms of history and psychology and science and so on. Um, but I'll stop this here. And if you've got any questions, comments, which I'm sure anybody listening to this will have a lot to say on it, then definitely do let us know in the comments. It'd be good to see some good conversations springing up and maybe some practical steps being taken and, and people realizing certain things and Maybe I'm going to realise something because you're going to show me something I didn't know. That's what this is all about. So if you've liked this, definitely do like and subscribe. If you're not already to wherever you see me, I'm on YouTube, Twitter, Eureka.org, 3speak.online, Steampeak, Steam websites, Minds.com, many different places. Uh, so yeah, do definitely share this along, re-Steam, re-blog, etc. Hit the notification bell on YouTube. And until next time, peace.